Identity. Well, if someone were to ask you, who are you, how would you answer that question? So I want to to get you to turn to the person next to you and try and answer the question beginning with, I am what? You have about a minute to discuss with the people next to you. There's no right or wrong answers. All right. Hopefully that's provided some discussion. How would you answer the question, I am? Well, let me give that answer for myself if I was to answer that question, I am. I am Megan, the daughter of Paul and Janine, sister of Joe and Pete, sister-in-law to Jono, aunt to Ben and Zoe. I'm a student at Moore College. I'm an Australian who lives in Sydney in the suburb of Newtown. I'm friend of Elise and Lauren and Maddie. I'm the owner of a Toyota Corolla. I'm a banker with the Commonwealth Bank, a shopper at Coles. I'm a fan of the recent Eurovision contest that was on. I'm a fan of the authors John Marsden and Patricia Cornwall, of TV shows Survivor and New Girl and CSI. I love summer days at the beach. I love relaxing with friends. And I love the Cadbury chocolate bar twirl. (laughs) Well, I've just told you lots of information about me, but I don't think that information really would sum me up. They are facts about me, but they aren't my identity or who I really am. Well, before we get to what the Bible says on our identity, it's helpful to think through what the world might say is our identity, what makes us who we are. And I think the world would define us by things like our culture and the influence that has on us, perhaps our career or our status, where we live and how much we earn. One of the big things in the media at the moment is our sexuality and how that is all wrapped up in our identity. And so we define ourselves by whether we are homosexual or heterosexual. And this becomes such a core part of our being that it really means who we are. Well, the word identity is actually not mentioned in the Bible, but the Bible does tell us a lot about who we are. And the Bible clearly tells us that our identity is not any of those things that I mentioned before. It's not our career, our culture, our status or our sexuality. The Bible tells us that our identity is in Christ. And one of the key differences here is that all of those things I mentioned before can change, whereas our identity in Christ is something constant and permanent. I can change the car I have, the relationship that I have with my family. I can change my culture and my career and my sexuality. Yet who we are in Christ is permanent and eternal. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible shows us what it means to have our identity in Christ and how that will shape our lives. Let's begin by looking at verse 1, 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Well, the author of this letter is the apostle Peter. Peter was an eyewitness to Jesus, his ministry, his death, and resurrection. He was one of the first people given the mission to make disciples of all nations. And going on, we see who this, re- who this letter is written to. It is written to God's elect, who are strangers in the world. This this is God's people who are scattered around all those different towns that are mentioned. Now, Peter wrote this letter in about 60 AD, initially to Jews, the majority of whom were living outside of their home in Palestine. They were strangers. They weren't living in their real home. They were disadvantaged. People were suspicious of them. They were financially worse off and under hardship. But this letter, whilst not just referring to Jews, is also referring to Gentiles or non-Jews. And they are also strangers because their home is in heaven. And this applies directly to Christians. Christians are alienated and dislocated from this world. We belong somewhere else. Christians are strangers here and at a disadvantage. Yet we are chosen. Look at verse 2 with me. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, 
for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Well, we have been chosen by God. What an amazing thing to know that God has single-handedly picked us out to be in relationship with him. Uh, this means we don't, need to val- we don't need to doubt our value or our worth, especially to God, because he has chosen us. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the TV show Survivor, uh, but it's about a bunch of castaways being taken from their ordinary homes and being placed on an island where they need to outwit, outplay and outlast all the other contestants to be crowned the ultimate survivor. And they win the prize of $1 million for doing so. But on the show, they have a lot of challenges. Some are reward challenges, where they win a prize, and other, are, other challenges are immunity challenges, which pr- uh, protects them from being voted off. Now, often they have really great r- reward challenges uh, near the end of the season, where the person who wins gets to go on this really amazing adventure. And I remember one season they had the prize that the person who won the challenge got to go to the top of an active volcano and just have a little picnic up there, which would be pretty an amazing experience. But the person who wins doesn't just get to go themselves, they also get to pick someone who goes with them, someone who hasn't won the challenge, yet they get to choose someone to share the experience with. Well, imagine if you were the player who didn't win the challenge, but you got chosen to go on this amazing reward anyway. You'd feel pretty loved, pretty special. Hopefully they weren't just doing it to make sure they won your vote. But we know how special it is to be chosen from everyday experience, don't we? Uh, Whether it's back in primary school, when your best friend gets chosen to choose the sports team, and so even though you're not very good at sport, you get chosen first anyway. Or whether you might be chosen by a friend to take into the movies. Um, I recently had gold class tickets given to me for my birthday, and I took my sister along with me. Well, I'm sure she felt very special and very chosen that I took her along to the movies. But we too can have great assurance that we are loved because God knows what we are like and yet he deliberately chooses us anyway. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 9 also repeat to us this idea that we are chosen by God and precious to him. So our identity is tied up in being strangers in this world, yet we are chosen by God. Our identity is not part of this world. This world is not our home. And we are chosen for obedience. This is what marks us out from the rest of the world. Jesus is our saviour, but he is also our Lord, and we are obedient to him. And we'll look a little bit what that looks like a little bit later on. But this is not all we find out about our identity. Look at verse 3 with me. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, we are born again into a living hope. And it is a living hope because it is based on Jesus' resurrection. He is alive today and we are united with him in that. The first time we were born, we only actually had one certainty, and that was death. We were born into a suffering and a decaying world that was perishing. And what can this mean but that previously we had no hope? There wasn't anything we could do to change the situation, and we had nothing to look forward to. In fact, not only did we have nothing to look forward to, we had something to fear. We had disobeyed and ignored God, And we're going to spend eternity without God and without the good that he gives us. This is what we deserved. Yet God had mercy on us. He didn't give us what we deserved. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, and because we are united in Christ, now we are alive and have hope. And so what do we hope for? Look with me at verses 4 and 5. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
for we are hoping in an everlasting inheritance. An inheritance is something that we usually get from our parents uh, when they pass away. I'm the executor of my parents' estate, and so I know that when they pass away, I'll receive approximately a third of their estate along with sharing it with my brother and sister. Uh, but my parents won't take anything that they currently own with them, will they? Everything in this life will be gone. And we see this every day. Food perishes, our environment suffers from global warming, cars spoil and rust and get sent to the wreckers, our eyesight and hearing fails, our teeth fall out. Every one of our material possessions won't last, or even if they outlive us, we get old and die. And isn't it strange to think that nothing, no one in this room will be here in a hundred years time. The only legacy you perhaps leave behind is your family, but I can't remember all the names of my great grandparents, and so even your family won't remember you. The only legacy that we have that lasts beyond death is Jesus' legacy, being born into his inheritance forever. And because we've been born again into God's family, God promises us this future inheritance. And this inheritance won't be destroyed by hostile elements. It can't be ruined by pollution or it can't fade away. And this is a certain thing that we hope for. It's not the kind of hope that, oh, I hope it's going to be sunny tomorrow, but we have no real assurance of it. It is a certain hope. It says our inheritance, our inheritance is kept in heaven meaning that it is already there waiting for us. And I think it can be really hard to grasp the idea of eternity, but if we just remember that it is going to be with God and that it will never end. Other parts of the Bible describe this awesome inheritance as being without pain or death or crying, but that we will live forever with God. But, I don't know if you're like me, we keep forgetting about this awesome inheritance. You see, imagine if I told you in five years' time, everyone here would inherit $1 million. Well, it would change the way you lived and would shape your life. The way you lived and worked, you wouldn't have to worry about money, so you could just do the things straight away that you wanted to. You could relax about the debts, about rent or mortgage repayments. You could study the course you've always dreamed of and get the low-paying job because money wouldn't matter. It would shape your priorities, your future, and most parts of your life. And the thing is, you wouldn't forget about it. And neither should we forget about our awesome inheritance. God cares so much for those who are in his care that he was willing to die and protect them and secure our salvation. So what is our identity? Well, in Christ, we are strangers in this world, yet chosen. We are people who are born again into an everlasting inheritance. And we look forward to that. But right now, we also see some practical outworking. Because being in Christ means that we can rejoice in the midst of suffering. Look with me at verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while... You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Well, there is no doubting that suffering exists everywhere. It's in every country, in every race, in the rich and the poor, in men and women, in young and old. And suffering occurs in all kinds of trials as well. From sickness to being treated unfairly at work, to conflict with in-laws. Some suffering is temporary and some lasts a lifetime. And so what does it mean to rejoice when we suffer? Are we supposed to laugh and be happy when our friends tell us they are sick? The answer to that is a resounding no. It is right to grieve and mourn and to comfort those who are suffering. One of my very good friends not long ago had a miscarriage and it would be horrible for her if I told her that she was wrong to be sad about this 
or if I was just very excited in the face of her concern for wanting to have children. This is a real thing to be sad about and to grieve. And this passage is not trying to make light of our suffering by calling it temporary, but it is helping us to look to our inheritance and eternity. Because the reason that we are told to rejoice in suffering is because we remember who we are and when we are living. We can glance back and know that we are chosen and we have been given new birth. And we can glance forward and look to our inheritance with God, knowing that we are living in the last days and that Jesus will return soon. When we look at the eternal picture, we can see that our life here by comparison is very short, like the faintest outline of a ship on a massive horizon. We can have this deep-seated feeling of contentment and joy because we know where we are headed. We are headed for eternal life with God. And not only that, but God is able to use something as horrible as suffering for our good. Our faith will be proved genuine. When our faith is put to the test, it becomes stronger. Uh, Now, this is maybe not a heaps helpful example, but when I was at uni, I was studying psychology, and I wasn't great at remembering lectures or sometimes even going to them. But come exam time, I knew that I had to study as much as I could so I could pass the test. And the funny thing was that if I didn't have that test at the end, then there's no way I would have learnt as much. It was only because of the test that my knowledge grew. And well, a similar situation applies to our faith. Suffering tests our faith in God because we can be going through some really hard and overwhelming times. But when God gets us through our trial or he helps us to cope with what's going on, this helps us to persevere and shows that our faith is true and endures forever, even in the hard times, as well as the good. And so this brings glory and praise to him. Um, If you think of when a child trusts in their parent, just has that implicit trust, knowing that their parent is going to do whatever will benefit them and is good for them, that gives their parent honour. And so it is the same with Jesus. When we trust in him, especially when times are hard, it gives him honour and glory. And when suffering is really hard, the death of a mum or dad, a brother or sister, the death of a child. The only real comfort is clinging on to heaven. And this was why Peter says that we rejoice when we are in trials, because he knows that this is a temporary suffering while we wait for the fulfilment of our salvation. And because this brings Jesus glory and honour, we rejoice. And not only do we rejoice in suffering, but we are also joyful in our salvation. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We rejoice in suffering because it refines our faith. But we also rejoice in our salvation, the goal of our faith. We can be even more glad of certain things when we face difficult times. And although we are saved now, our salvation will be fully revealed when Jesus returns and we will experience our eternal inheritance with him. We haven't seen Jesus yet, but because we love him and believe that he gave his life for us, We are filled with ultimate contentment and satisfaction and joy at our salvation. Joy so great that is actually inexpressible and words can't describe it. Well, thinking back to what we discussed at the start, do you finish that sentence at the beginning saying, I am a Christian? If so, then this is you. This is your identity. You are chosen, born again hoping in an everlasting inheritance, rejoicing in suffering, and joyful in salvation. What if you had ended that sentence by saying, I'm not a Christian? If you haven't put your faith or trust in God, 
then the first step to becoming one of his followers and having this secure identity in Jesus is to put our trust in him. Jesus paid the ultimate price by giving his life that we might live. Further on in 1 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Well, have you put our trust, have you put your trust in our great God who gives life, who gives eternal life? He is God, whether you acknowledge him or not, but your response to him now will determine whether you spend eternity with him or without him. Well, what if you are struggling? Struggling to trust God and his promises? Struggling with doubts because life gets in the way and this life can be very hard. Firstly, don't forget. Don't forget who you are. That you don't actually belong here, but you belong with God. That you are chosen by him. That you look forward to an everlasting inheritance that will never spoil or fade. Being able to rejoice in suffering because we are sure of our salvation. Secondly, praise God. The only response to all that God has done for us is to praise him. Well, how can we praise God? Uh, Prayer is one of the great ways we can give God the praise and honour he deserves. Sometimes I find it quite hard to think of words to say, but looking through the book of Psalms especially or other parts of the Bible can really help us to praise God. Uh, We sing praises to God in church and you can get onto iTunes and download some great Christian music as well. And so we can praise God to God or we can praise him to others by telling people how great he is. So we don't forget, we praise God. And thirdly, we live obedient lives. This is because our identity leads to action. We need to live as who we are. And I'm wary to give a list of things because that make us obedient because the gospel isn't about moralism, doing this, not doing that. But because we have been born again into God's family, we are his children and we take on the family likeness of the Father. And so we are holy, we are set apart and this is for a purpose because we belong to God and not to this world, which has implications for how we live. Be who you are. Being obedient children means we obey God's word. We spend time regularly reading the Bible and listening to God and talking to God in prayer. We meet up with other Christians each week at church and Bible study to encourage each other. We have pure speech and we have love in our actions and words. Well, this is our identity. This is being who we are in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us a secure identity in Christ. Thank you that in the midst of a changing world, you have chosen us to be with you forever. Please help us to remember these truths, to praise you and to be obedient children, living in light of who we are. Amen.